Good morning, Walnut Grove. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. We have several announcements we'd like to tell you about. First off, our Orange Cooperative Parish has been working together for several years, but very closely throughout this pandemic. And we're continuing to work with each other for Advent. Guys, Advent is rolling in hot. It is only a few weeks away. It's hard to believe, but it's true. And some of the things that we're doing is one, we are selling wreaths and greenery for the Christmas season. So if you're interested, check out the email that went out on Friday with the e-nutshell. There is a Word document and a PDF in there of the order. So you can check it out. It's got everything that's being sold plus the prices. So we need your order and we need your payment by Saturday, November 23rd. You can email in your orders, you can mail in your orders and your payments, or we'll put a basket on a table just inside the fellowship hall. You can come drop your orders and your payment off there. We do ask that you pay with check or cash. Also, we're doing Christmas caroling. Who doesn't love Christmas caroling? I love to sing, but I'm not very good. But I love Christmas caroling, and I know that you guys do too. So Julia Alliger, who many of you know, used to come here to Walnut Grove, but she's the pastor at uh, Chestnut Ridge and Clover Garden. She's heading that up. So if you're interested in doing any Christmas caroling this year, please email us at walnutgrovemethodist at gmail.com. We'll be sure that Julia knows that you want to go Christmas caroling with her this year. We also remind you of our online platform of giving for your tithes and offerings. We're also still taking donations for Harvest Festival since we weren't able to have Harvest Festival this year. We are asking people to donate what you would usually use, what you would usually pay at Harvest Festival. The fund for Harvest Festival helps for us to keep up this beautiful building. Uh, the sanctuary is behind me and it has practically a brand new roof on it. That came out of the Harvest Festival Fund. So it keeps up our beautiful campus. So please consider giving to those. You can find the link in our e-nutshell. If you're having issues with that, please let one of us know. We'd be glad to help you. Happy giving. As we go into worship, will you please join me in our opening prayer? Father God, you promise us that where two or more are gathered, you are there in the midst. Father, we welcome you amongst us today and celebrate the gift of life that you have given to each of us. We ask that you would open our ears so that we may hear your voice. Open our minds so that we may receive your eternal wisdom. Open our spirits that we may know your guidance. And open our hearts that we may receive your everlasting abundant love. Amen.
Good morning, friends. So in worship the last few weeks, Pastor Laura has been talking to us about something called the Lord's Prayer, which you may have heard, you may have said before, um, but it's also something that you'll continue to say. And so it's good for all of us to learn it. So have you prayed before? Maybe before a meal with your family or before bedtime? What did you pray for? Was it maybe healing for a sick family member or safety for somebody who's traveling or maybe for comfort for yourself or just to like feel God's presence with you? Um, Those are all things that we pray for. So what is the Lord's Prayer then? The Lord's Prayer is just something that Jesus taught his disciples that we can read about in the Bible. It's something that Jesus taught his disciples to pray a way to talk to God that Jesus specifically told his disciples to do. So it's something that we, um, in the year 2020, have still done because Jesus told his disciples, and so we do it as his disciples. So it's a way to talk to God and say, it's not about what we want. We have prayer requests, but ultimately, God, it's about what you want, not about what we want. It's a way to say to God, I see you, and to ask God to be with us. That's all that that prayer is. So I want to say it together because this is what we're learning about. Um, You can look at the screen. You can close your eyes. But I want you to repeat after me. And adults, you can do this too. So let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And amen. We said that together, so now you can listen for that when we say it uh, together as a church. You might hear it in the sermon today. We might say it after a different sort of prayer, but now you know the Lord's Prayer. Our first scripture reading today is Matthew 6, 12. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And from Colossians 3, 12 through 14. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, Forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts Be pleasing to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, in this time of global pandemic and social distancing, many have taken on a different way of getting ready for work and going to school, especially if you are spending the day on Zoom. Many folks, and they've made uh, jokes and parodies about this, Um, have just gotten ready kind of from the halfway up, wearing a nice top, um, but letting uh, yourself wear pajama pants on the bottom and perhaps uh, fuzzy socks for the day to stay a little bit more comfortable, almost being kind of half-dressed. And like many of you, perhaps, as we still await at this point uh, the president-elect of the United States, we feel kind of half dressed ourselves. The nation certainly appears to be kind of divided along party lines. 
in certain states where they've been red or blue or they're still counting ballots, so many have said they've kind of gone on to this level of being purple, the red and the blue being unified. And prayerfully, that is how we are too when we worship here at Walnut Grove, having people, I imagine, on both sides of the political aisle, knowing some lean uh, towards uh, the right and some towards the left. We know we're defined, though most, uh, not so much by being a party of the elephant or the donkey, but by the blood of the lamb. And we know this good news of forgiveness that frees us, that brings us back to unity, that perhaps we need to be people of forgiveness. Maybe we've been the ones to say words um, that have not been heard readily or hurtfully uh, to our sisters and brothers in Christ. Maybe we've engaged in rhetoric that was hurtful to a larger group of people. And we long to be people who are always clothed with compassion and clothed with kindness and holiness and patience and goodness, as we know uh, from reading the words, the epistles uh, from Paul. Now, N.T. Wright, when he talks about forgiveness, he talks instead that in our culture today, perhaps more than genuine forgiveness, maybe we've taught in our generations this kind of tolerance instead uh, instead of forgiving truly people, which at most is kind of a low grade, okay, well that's just how they are or sweeping the issues under the carpet. But if we remember the parable of the prodigal son, we know that when the father sees the son return home, he goes out and he runs towards him, not just tolerating him, but bringing him back into the fullness of the fold, knowing that Jesus' ways of forgiveness are of the genuine article. And they remind us not to make substitutions, not to engage in a cancel-like culture, because Jesus has already canceled our sins. Forgiveness, it has been said, may be the most political act that we as Christians engage in, that we possess. Because as people of faith, we forgive others. There is empowerment in this prayer. We first seek that power of forgiveness from our Lord who has forgiven us of our trespasses time and time again and calls us to forgive others. Now, if you read the scripture and perhaps think, wait, wait a minute, I heard the word debtors instead, you'll know, especially if you have Presbyterian family or maybe grew up Presbyterian, that in the Presbyterian church, uh, thanks, we might say to John Calvin, um, on Sunday mornings when the Lord's Prayer is shared, it's usually with uh, this version uh, from Matthew of debtors. We in the Methodist Church typically share trespasses instead. And there's an urban legend that goes back to why that may be. Presbyterians were known as Scots, and they were said to be the merchants, and the British were said to be the landowners. So it made more sense for the landowners to talk about trespasses and affected the Scots more so to talk about debtors for the financial implication that it has. But we also are reminded that this language of debtor, though we don't use it very much, can be critical in our world today. Especially when so many Americans um, and people around the world are saddled in debt, whether it be from school or medical bills or from fixing up homes, credit card debt, life expenses, have made um, people like Dave, Dave Ramsey household names because he's got a TV show, I think, and a radio show that talks about reducing your personal debt, being programs that churches have like Financial Peace University to try to help families tackle being debt-free. Uh, churches at times, as missions, will take on medical bills from families or perhaps pay off some school lunches in a nearby public school. And as in the church and it is our lives, there's so many ways that we can reduce debt, not to mention global debt. 
with developing countries around the world. But whether it's trespasses we use or debts, Jesus tears up, we may say, all the IOUs. Our story of forgiveness begins with God and Israel, that trespassing in the Garden of Eden. It continues on with the good news of Jesus Christ dying for our sins and teaching us how to live in the freedom from sin and death that we are called to share with others. Now, during World War II, there was a Christian watchmaker then turned writer uh, named Corey Tin Boom. And the story is told of Corey Tin Boom, how she had a hard time forgiving herself. Um, not being able to forget this one wrong that was done to her, how she had to forgive this person. She kept rehashing it at night, as often as the case when we go to sleep, trying to rest, and she could not. And so finally she cried out to God and shared this problem. And thankfully she heard the words, uh, this comparison of about going up into the rafters of a church. And up in the church tower there was a bell that was rung as it was pulled the rope. And after the section was let go, the bell kept swinging back and forth, the ding and the dong. And then as the slower and slower it got, until the sound finally stopped. Often that's how we find forgiveness as well, when we take our hand off the rope. Because often what we've been tugging at are the grievances, the pain for so long, and we become angry, and the sound doesn't seem to go away until we let it go. And so it proved to be with her, she said, after just a few more nights of this going on, she was able in conversation and prayer to let it go. And altogether, after a while, it became less and less, knowing that she could trust in God with her thoughts and feelings in prayer. Often when we think of forgiveness, we also think in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 18, 22, when it talks about forgiveness depending on our translation, we may think that number will get us off the hook. Jesus in uh, the King James Version, it's 70 uh, times 7. Um, in other translations, it's 7 times or 70 times. But no matter the number where it's 7 or 77 or 490 times, forgiveness, we know, is always a gift from God. It's the story of our salvation, that oppression and exile, according to all the prophets, that begins with Israel's sin. Israel is set free from that oppression and exile, liberation of forgiveness of sins. Then John the Baptist, we know, comes later on the scene in the New Testament, foretelling in the wilderness, offering this baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins and reminding people that they don't have to live and suffer in their bad consciousness anymore to find relief. But in essence, as we hear these words, it's this re-entering again of the salvation story, going through Jordan to reenact Exodus. And then his cousin, the Messiah, comes on the scene, taking that message from the wilderness of Judea to the streets and villages around him as a person who lived out the faith God, the Father's only begotten Son, going, sharing what was often in the temple where forgiveness was formally dispensed, going out and freeing people and healing people. And as we think about forgiveness today, we may ask ourselves and wonder, what does it feel like to be forgiven? It feels like freedom, we may remember. For when we are getting up and ready in the morning in our world today, prayerfully we know that when we are freed and forgiven, that we are dearly loved. We are loved and we are living in the power of forgiveness. It is so very hard for us at times because often when we think about being dressed, we don't think about it in terms of compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness, not to forget patience, being bound in perfect unity. It's this tall order, but one given freely as we have freely been forgiven by Christ. And to be freely forgiven from Christ means that we in response freely 
forgive others as we walk in God's ways. And forgiveness for us becomes this way of habit. It's something that we do each day. A couple years ago, I um, had put off going to the dentist probably longer than I should have and went uh, to get my teeth cleaned. And of course, it always feels great um, afterwards. And they gave me, for, I always think that's the best part, getting that little uh, goodie bag with the new toothbrush and the travel size toothpaste. And this time I got flossers and a little thing of floss. And I remember the hygienist making the comment, said, you know, floss your teeth. Floss them in the morning. I didn't have any cavities, thankfully, but floss your teeth in the morning and in the evening and after meals. Make it a habit as part of your day. And of course, as we grow up, perhaps we teach our children, brush your teeth, maybe get older, drink eight glasses of water a day, exercise, eat vegetables and fruit. We know all these healthy habits. And part of being a healthy Christian is the power of forgiveness having that formed in us as a healthy habit for how we live. Because we perhaps all carry with us at times bruises, whether they be painful ones of things that people have done for us, things long ago or just recently in our lives. And to be clear, I want to make sure not to normalize any kind of physical pain. Because of course, if someone's living in an abusive or dangerous situation, that is never to be normalized. Forgiveness does not mean becoming a victim of violence and prayerfully help is sought when needed. But we equate forgiveness with freedom for it reminds us that we all need to be loved and to be cherished and that we all are loved and cherished by God. When we are in relationship with others, that is what is to ground us. God's love does not hurt or harm us. And yet we acknowledge at times others have hurt us with their words and their actions, what they did or didn't mean to do. Pain gets etched into our memory. Pain breaks down eroding trust, eroding relationships that are hard to be built without trust. And as we've mentioned in previous weeks, the need for lament, praying out to God and crying to him through perhaps the Psalms or being frank with our own needs and saying, Lord, I need to repent of this sin. You know the needs of my heart, Lord, cleanse me. And after all, God of all people can teach us of what it's like to live because God knows and has experienced painful things to God's own self with hurtful words and actions still today. But forgiveness as Christians begins as a response because, again, we have been forgiven first. Forgive our trespasses, we pray first before we even pray about relationships with others. It's very hard to forgive someone else without being reminded that it comes from this empowerment of being forgiven by God. For to do so without Christ would be shallow forgiveness. It would still have this sense of control. Our forgiveness for others comes first from being forgiven for God and knowing that we have to see it in light of God's forgiveness, not trying to act on our own will, which leads us, we may say, back down the paths of tolerance or a cancel-like culture, but knowing that God at all times loves us and that God does not always accept what we do, but longs for us to turn back to God, to confess our sins, and to readily then go and forgive others. It's interesting that salvation in the Greek, it said, is often translated health or wholeness or peace, maybe even harmony or oneness or shalom, another word for peace. But often, when we are not people who practice forgiveness, we find ourselves kind of trying to continue in this anger or resentment or at times maybe guilt. And those ways will actually affect our health. Scientifically, anger and resentment create within us this unhealthy stress ways that actually takes the way the vitamins and minerals 
in our bodies. It suppresses our immune system. <laughs> One person joked, well, wouldn't it be nice that if anger and resentment could find a way to uh, make us even stronger physically instead of weaker physically? And I was thinking to myself, especially as we approach flu season, as we're in a global pandemic, wouldn't it be amazing to even think of forgiveness, not just in terms of how it affects us spiritually, but it affects all of us, even our physical beings, bringing healing to our very soul and body as well. And couldn't forgiveness be the key to bringing healing to our divided nation as we admit we too need forgiveness first and foremost for our sins so again that we can go and forgive others and be humble enough to admit when we've done something wrong to a neighbor or friend and to be assured enough that we walk in God's ways that we seek to live in the light of this world to be called and clothed in the ways of forgiveness as a habit just like the air that we breathe in jesus name we pray by the power of forgiveness we pray amen this morning to be presented to Beverly Eider from Wendell, North Carolina, who is a friend of Lorraine Hines. She has multiple health issues. Quilt number two goes to Jessica Hammonds from St. Paul's, North Carolina. She is recovering from Injuries sustained from an automobile accident. She is a friend of Linda Reynolds and is Jim Reynolds' caregiver. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? You are here with us today, God. Your voice might feel quiet and your presence might feel distant, but you are here with us wherever we are. Help us to feel your presence fully. Let us know your goodness deeply. Hear our prayers to you this morning, O God. We know you are loving and gracious and powerful. Hear us now. Lord, we come before you first as a community. Hear these prayers from us, your people of Walnut Grove. We continue to lift up Lorraine Hines and Kim Horton, who are both recovering from surgery. 
We pray for those in our families and communities who are battling COVID-19. We pray for Caroline Lloyd, who is a child under a year old in the ICU and on a ventilator. And God, for all the prayers that remain sitting quietly in our hearts, we ask that you hear them and answer them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we pray this morning for political leader, leaders in our community, state, country, and world. Be at work in these leaders, guiding them in their work to bring glory to you. May their words speak life and may their actions promote your justice in the world. God, you are ruler of all. All glory belongs to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray today for the church universal. With so much division in the world, show your people how to be a united church. Remind us that we are indeed part of one body, the body of Christ. Show us as individuals and as a community what our roles are in being the body of Christ in the world. Bless our church leaders that they might lead your people to promote your justice, love, and mercy in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now we pray as you taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. forgiven us. And in through God's forgiveness of us, we may be empowered to forgive others. Go in peace.